Hi, Steve. Hello, Lauren. How, How are you? How are you doing? I'm good. How's your hair? Not as fluffy <laughs> as it should be, apparently. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. You're very lucky. Um, so we're going to have a chat about Hollywood Games stuff, but let's start with favourite Guildford game. Favourite Guildford game? Of all time. Of all time? Yeah. Of all time, populous. Ooh. It's easy. It rolls off the tongue. There's no yeah, effort required. It's a good one. It's a good one. You How know. many hours, do you reckon? Oh, um... Years. Years. <laughs> yeah, years, I think. I can yeah, understand yeah. why. I can understand why yeah. I love that one as well. Huh. Gosh, it feels like a lifetime ago. So a similar is. kind of thing. Yeah, it is. That's exactly <laughs> why. Um, I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, I, wasn't a, I wasn't a child. Oh, God, no. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so if you could work, take, I mean, take your kind of career out of it almost. If you could work oh. on any game or any studio, past and present, in the town, what would be your absolute like holy grail of of Guildford video game to that's, work on a site? I mean, you can and you can enjoy that, playing that, on it too. That's really interesting because it's so diverse. There's, mm. there's a lot of stuff going on, and this this sounds terribly terribly um, conceited. I've kind of worked on most of the things I wanted to. I've had the real good fortune to work with, although I didn't work at Electronic Arts here. Mm. I worked at Electronic Arts in the US. Um, well, my friend Stuart was kind of producing Harry Potter, which was a big title for this, you know, for this area. Um, and then I worked with Lionhead, so I worked on things I really wanted to. Um, and I worked with Media Molecule, so I got to work on things. And, and work, yeah. you know, I get to work here, so I don't know. I don't think there's anything that I haven't done that I really, really, really wanted to. Maybe, maybe during the kind of the mobile boom, when there were a lot of little studios doing like really funky little projects. Mm. Um, that wasn't something which was accessible to me because I'm kind of working on bigger products. Yeah. So, so maybe that area was something I didn't really experience. That's, uh, that's a really good answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good answer because it did you know we did get kind of a bubbling that as we often do with with Guildford yeah. things in general there's a, yeah, you know, you know, a bubbling the, and then it all kind of kicks off a bit I think like most trends in the industry when you're a kind of a hub those trends mm. create new business opportunities and so you saw a lot of growth and yeah. you saw a lot of small micro studios come and unfortunately some of them have gone and some of them have consolidated you know we've We've, we've benefited from a lot of those small studios bringing talent to the area and then hiring that talent yeah. into our studio. Unfortunately, sometimes when those studios fold, uh, but also when those studios grow and change and people kind of look for new opportunities. Mm. It's been, it's been, I, I can't be negative about it. Well, that's it. But even, even on you know, those very sad occasions where, where studios fold, that's when everyone rallies together to go, OK, what do you need? How many artists yeah. are there? How many designers? How can we try and kind of yeah. bring everyone back into the Guildford fold? And, yeah, and, kind of and there have been a kind way. of a few kind of big moments. Obviously, you know, when some of the bigger studios convulsed mm. and then big changes, then yeah. when, when Lionhead eventually shuttered, that was a kind of a big impact. And there yeah. were people, um, you know, people on the market but they diffuse fairly quickly mm. and there's a you know within Guildford and then there's people there's studios just outside, just outside Guildford yeah. and then you're close to London so there's a lot of opportunity yeah for sure and that it, it kind of leads us quite quite nicely into um what's changed I mean since you've started working in in the Guildford industry Gosh. how how much has changed what would you say are the biggest kind of tangible changes that the industry's dealt with here well I think obviously Guildford has gone from a number of quite large studios, um, they subdivided. Mm. There were a lot of medium-sized uh, studios. When Supermassive started out, there was a... Lionhead was still around. Um, Codemasters, I mm. think, had, had, we, we took over the space that Codemasters had. Oh, so there's, I used there's, to work there. Yeah, so, there's, so, there's, <laughs> so there was that kind of environment. And then, obviously, unfortunately, some of those studios were pulled out of Guildford mm -hmm. and... There were, there were the, not micro, but smaller studios formed up, a lot of people. And it kind of coincided, I think, with the rise of mobile gaming mm -hmm. and more accessible platforms, um, rather than kind of traditional console and PC gaming. So a lot of those people went into small studios. They made slightly smaller games than mm -hmm. we were making as those bigger studios. Um, um, and, you know, we obviously carried on our path of, making big games. That's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's what Supermassive have been doing, making larger products. But I think Guildford as a whole, at that point, was a lot of small, micro, and you know, mid-sized studios, which were the fallout of those big studios' changes. Um, and so you kind of, you know, I still meet people who I haven't worked with since Lionhead, 
who've worked at two or three companies here in Guildford, yeah. but have never never, ne- ne- never quite, worked with me. You quite again. often find that you're chasing each yeah. other in some instances. Yeah. All and also, yeah, exactly. That we almost create our own ecosystem, I guess. We're yeah. shedding and then more's popping up and then that may shed and then more, more studios yeah. can come. Can and you come hope from that. that you hope that those cycles of change in the studios create kind of a vacuum at the bottom where mm. you bring people in. Yeah. You know, you kind of reach out to to bring more talent into the area. And I think that kind of creates kind of a positive thing in Guildford. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's never felt that it's shrinking, which I think is the interesting thing. Even when like the big studios uh, came and went, maybe, it didn't feel like all of a sudden everyone left Guildford. I used to work in Bristol, um, and um, I worked for one big developer, uh, Microprose, just outside Bristol. We then left. We set up another developer in a studio in Bristol, so did someone else. Both of those closed down, and Guildford became almost a wasteland of games development for a number of years. Mm. It didn't happen here. Even when the big studios went, there were people who had their lives here, there was talent and that's here, it, yeah. and everyone's kind of hung yeah. around. It's so I think, I think that's, it's, it's got a life cycle that's maybe slightly different from some of the other places. I wonder why that is. That's interesting. Or people maybe kind yeah. of like living here. Cute little place, I <laughs> yeah, guess. Exactly. Nice bit of greenery. Um, so what would you say... In your time in games, what, what have, what's the industry, it only has to be one thing, I'm sure there are thousands of things that the industry has overcome in its, in its uh, life cycle. Um, what would you say the industry's overcome and, and where has that been reflected within, within the Guildford scene? I suppose part of it is that boom and bust cycle, mm. which was definitely part of the industry back probably in the 90s. Yeah. You probably kind of, you, you know, there were far fewer studios developing games and therefore if you didn't work for one of those studios, you either had to do it in your back bedroom. But now, finding more like-minded people, even if you're working in a distributed development environment, mm. is a fairly typical thing. I mean, it's that ability to not have to be physically located together, even if you work in the same town. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the studios through the difficulties of this year haven't really had huge difficulties in maintaining their cohesion because they already have had more flexible working arrangements. Yeah. They've, of, they've, they've often had distributed you know, team structure anyway. Um, obviously for us, like the bigger studio, we are all under one roof. That was a, definitely a challenge. But some of the smaller studios, it hasn't really impacted them at all because not everyone was in the office every day. That's it. And so yeah. that working behaviour, the fact that you can work with someone either down the road or on the other side of the world, as effectively um, as you could on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. I think that's been a kind of a big, 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 big kind of change to uh, people's behaviour and has, has allowed people perhaps to stay in the area, to not have to make such huge changes to their lifestyles, mm. but to continue to be involved in games development. So that's probably the biggest thing that, you know, the infrastructure that makes that possible. Mm. It's such a great answer because of all of the things that the games industry's dealt with, what we've seen in this in this last kind of yeah. six months, year has been the most like, oh no, <laughs> like yeah. well, what are we going to do now? But you're right. I suppose it's, you know, we're, how many teams outside of video games sit together at, at, at lunchtime and play games together? So most of us already have those connections. Yeah, so yeah. the actual distance doesn't make any difference yeah, so to it. See, rather than playing around the corner yeah, uh, exactly. uh, the game, we'll just play it over the internet it It won't be that much of a difference and you know i I think the other the other factor is that the demand for games is just on this upward curve Um, with or without the current situation it was an upward curve Mm. the amount of people playing games and the diversity of devices they're playing on the success of the platforms and continued growth in all the big platforms i think that's just you know the appetite for content is not diminishing and so somewhere like guildford where there are a lot of people who make content, is benefited by that 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 global uptick in games. And there's, there's no sign of it going away. Yeah. You know, games are here; they're going to stay and they're going to grow. You know, yes, other industries will suffer. We've seen that evidence in TV and film mm-hmm. potentially. But I think overall, you know, despite the fact it's not a great year, as a as an industry in a place, we've probably been able to weather that better than some. Yeah, we're, we're luckier than we probably realise we are. I think I we're think, very much luckier situation. than we realise. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see Guildford Games achieve in, in the future going forward? I think you're always looking for the place and the people you work with to kind of be on the map. You know, Whether that's ego or 
or whatever. It's pride. You, yeah, maybe it is. But you know, you don't make video games to ha- to to be isolated. That's a, it's a weird concept. But you make video games because that you you know that your idea will then be shared with someone. Someone else will experience your idea and they'll like it or enjoy it. Maybe they won't, but they will react to it. So mm. you, you you make things that reach out and touch people. Um, and I think that you know. Whenever there is a big success product that comes from Guildford, it has benefits for everybody mm. in Guildford. It's not it's not just that one studio's success. Um, it's the success of the whole area. So, you know, we're, we're talking, we started about old games, mm. yeah? You know, those older games mm. put Guildford on the map, for, absolutely for sure. But there have been, a, there is a, there is a series over the years of games that have kept Guildford if you were to look through the lens of games development and Guilford and the games that are released, there's a, there's, there's a continuation, mm. you know, from products that are made by, you know, Electronic Arts, Supermassive, uh, Lionhead, uh, Media Molecule. There are lots of big games. And then if you are into the, you know, in, into mobile gaming, again, there is a huge thread mm. of content that's constantly being made. So I think that's the thing. The, you know, you're always waiting for either you you hope to be making that next big game, or for one of the other studios in the town to be making that big thing that then kind of, that's the continue, that's the through line of Guildford's success yeah. in games. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And also, you know, you really see there's, there's nothing more, you know, launch days stressful and exhausting and terrifying and all of those yeah. things, but you open Twitter and you see every other studio around oh. going, oh, have a great day, congrats, it looks amazing. Yeah. And suddenly everything just feels a little yeah. bit calm. You know, what, 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 you know, as I said, whether it's the you know, bigger studios like us or some of the newer studios, guys like Fireproof, yeah. you know, when The Room came out, I don't know anyone who didn't play that game. Oh, I think I played it three or four times in exactly. a row. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's not about big games. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, it is about things that, that are successful. And Guildford has a huge amount, like play sport. I'm a big Formula One nerd, sorry. Um, but, you know, I remember when, when, when they brought out their motorsport manager, I don't think I put my phone down. Yeah? <laughs> because yeah. it was just, you know, and I, so, so we make, Guildford makes lots of games. Lots. You know, and that's, and that's, that's, the, that's the really cool thing. And it's you, yes, your success is important, but you also need everyone else in this ecosystem to be successful. Yeah, because again, you're looking to, to create a place where people want to come and work, yeah. where the best talent wants to come. Um, and people, while they'll come to you for an opportunity, they've also got half an eye on what else is going on. Absolutely. Because, you know, if you go somewhere and there's one developer, you're going to work for them and you bring your whole family with you and then that all goes wrong, what are you going to do? Well, Guildford doesn't look like that, does it? Mm. Guildford looks like a range of opportunities. So, so talent finds it easier to accept Guildford as a, as a destination. Going on that um, topic, how important is learning? I mean, of course, to, to, the, to the wider industry, you know, everything we learn is really important. But within the microcosm, within Guildford, where, right. you know, you've got the same devs who may be bumping into each other down the pub and we're all under NDA and it's terrifying and <laughs> all of that stuff. But at the same time, there's so much of our uh, knowledge and learnings and processes that are just beneficial to everyone. Yeah, Absolutely. I think that everyone benefits in a sense, especially when you, if you, you, know, you work with people, they go their separate ways, you then end up, you, know, you don't sit down in the pub and just talk about what you're making. No. You talk about what the, what the process is like, you know, what the ups and downs of that process are. And you pick up on, there are trends, there are, kind of there, there are new tools that come out, there are people doing things slightly differently, trying to engage with the different type of you know, staff or group of people or whatever. That stuff is, is always kind of part of the, the discussion, I think. Yeah. So I think that there's a kind of a lot of cross-pollination, even if it's non-intentional, because you're going to talk about what you do. You're going to talk about how you do it. Um, and that kind of becomes shared. Whether, you, whether you're talking about what I do on a day-to-day basis when I grab the keyboard and the things I type, or the way we like to organise, or the way we like to celebrate our mm. successes, or the type of environments we like to create for our teams to work in. All of those things are conversations that happen. Yeah, and I, I just feel that they're, that they're so very important, and I've seen it so many times, especially with, with younger developers as they you know, come in for the first time and get an NDA and, and, and all of that potentially for the first time, you yeah. know, outside of interview situations. Um, and I feel that you know, sometimes it can really 
lock us down. But the process of what we're doing as a whole requires more of an ebb and flow of, of kind of conversation and, and all of that kind of stuff. And yeah, yeah I just wonder whether we're, whether we're, um, whether it's known how important it is that we, that we share that stuff, I, you know, yeah, within. I, I, you're right, that people do, do feel students. very, you know, we don't want, we don't want to talk about the details mm. of what we're doing until we've done well, it, kind it. of done it. Yeah. But on the other hand, the methodology yeah. that we use is, is, a, is a shared language. You know, there's, we're all using roughly the same tools. We're all roughly using the same software, mm. even if our end goals are very, very different. And so those problems and issues and concerns are something which people do talk about because you can talk about it without being talking about the thing you're making. Yeah, without being too specific. You can without kind of, being too yeah. specific. And, you know, we are sensitive, um, and, but I think, I think you could be over-hopeful that people would be... You know, very closed, and, and and when I say over hopeful, I mean in a kind of a negative way that, mm. that people would be. But I don't think they are. I think I think you know, whilst people probably don't talk about their job continuing down the pub, when you go to a pub in Guildford, seventy percent of the people in there on certain nights will be people who make video games. Absolutely, and and you could overhear a lot of conversations about similar sorts of topics. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone, of course, they're talking there's, about what they do. There's definitely been those occasions where you've heard someone, then you go to a team like, have you heard of this? They're talking about this program. I don't think we're using that yet. We should get on that. And then all of a sudden, you've got this whole thing to go on just from uh, nipping out for a quick pint, which is yes. quite wonderful. Um, so talking about a quick pint, <laughs> although it doesn't really need to be entirely about pubs, um, you're a new dev. You've moved into Guildford. You've got your job. You're really excited. You're ready to go. What do you do? Where do you go first? Where would you recommend? Oh, who would you? I see. mean, not who would you talk to, but are there events that people could be going to or resources they could be calling so on? That again has ebbed and flowed in Guildford. There were times, maybe a couple of years ago, where you know you had to be down the Drummond on a Thursday night. Yeah, that was the rule. Yeah, or you're down the Stoke. Yeah, Th those were the places to go. Or the White House mm. on a lunchtime. I love the White House. Um, Again, I'm not sure I'm in touch enough with that activity to be able to say, oh, this place at this time, you know. I remember the piano bar. Yeah. yeah? The piano bar used to be, on a Friday night, every single 20-something game developer in Guildford was crammed in there. I don't think that's the case. Well, I don't think it's open anymore. I don't think it exists anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... But Guilford has quite because we've got like you know we, we, we've got the Academy of uh, Contemporary Music, mm -hmm. we've got you know, university. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of people socially mobile and moving around in Guilford. There's a lot of you know, pop into the Five and Lime or whatever mm -hmm. your whatever your taste is. You'll find people of mm -hmm. a similar age, and within that sub that group, you'll find people mm -hmm. who make video games. Definitely. Um, so I don't think I can be specific and say, oh yes, down the Drummond. On a Thursday Talks and to the a guy Tuesday, in the, corner. Yeah. Guy, the shady looking <laughs> bloke in the one. corner yeah. with, the, with the iPad, he's the way in. No, that's not the way it works. But I think that it's because, it, because it's perhaps it's become less specific because it's become very pervasive. Mm. You, I don't believe I can go to any coffee shop or any pub and not see someone who's making games. So I go and have a cup of coffee um, up the top of town mm -hmm. quite regularly. I always see someone from Moji Works in the same coffee <laughs> every single time, but it won't be the same people. Yeah. So there's so you know, many of us. There's so many of us. That's the problem. There's so many people. So how are how are Supermassive working to encourage new talent into into the town? So we have a whole bunch of kind of initiatives around talking, particularly from my point of view, particularly with, with education. Mm -hmm. um, so we have relationships with National Film and Television School, Falmouth University, Goldsmiths, Brunel, a whole bunch of universities who we try to actively engage with. We try and spend some time with them. In fact, I've been doing work with the Academy of Contemporary Music. They awesome. have a games development course. I didn't know that. Exactly. You didn't know that. They have a oh. games development course. Um, and um, yeah, um, it's just taking a few hours out of your week mm. and spending it with people who aren't making games already is kind of what I do. Um, so as a studio, that's been our kind of our policy is to try to reach out, find places that have a nurturing talent, and mm -hmm. that tends to be universities, colleges, and go and talk to them. Um, we do stuff with Godalming College. They have various courses around... Um, 
IT mm-hmm. and uh, development ideas, we engage with them. So we get we you know, we we get you know A level students into the studio. Cool. We give them pitching exercises and that kind of stuff. You you know I go to schools. I go to like you know uh, you know careers evenings mm-hmm. at various schools. Talk to kids. Not that they're going to be ready when they finish their O levels. Sorry, GCSEs. Old person here. Um, when they finish their GCSEs, they're not going to immediately drop into making games. But by the time you're 16, yeah. you've got to be thinking about yeah. this. You know, are you any good at maths? If not, come into the games yeah, industry. Yeah, exactly. I'm Don't rubbish. do programming. Yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of activity you can do. I think as an industry, we're mediocre at doing it. Um, and I don't think we're very coordinated in the way we do it. I think that's definitely a problem. Um, but you, it doesn't take much to make mm. an effort. You'd be surprised at how many places are absolutely over the moon to talk to someone from the industry who's, who wants to talk about it, rather than just kind of going up and going, I'll give you a lecture on how we do yeah, stuff. No, that's not really what people want to talk about. Yeah. You know, It's the, the many facets of game development, I imagine, are quite... I mean, I don't want to say unknown, but certainly when I was growing up, I didn't think about video no. games as a career, an no. industry, just something that appeared every now and then that I liked. Cool, well, I'll play this. But I never sat there and thought, how did they do that? And even as you know, as you get older, if, if I hadn't have been you know, in the Guildford postcode already, I would have had no idea that this was yes, here. But it's I suppose, very inaccessible. Yeah, but I suppose for, for younger kids, it must be much more of a, you know, a, an achievable yes. and, and kind of more laid out path. I think it's been broken down a lot as we've gone past the big monolithic studios. We've gone down into smaller developers. We've developed social media specifically targeted at gamers um, and particularly narrow casting like Twitch and YouTube mm-hmm. where Let's Play and all that other stuff exposes people to the activity of enjoying games, mm-hmm. which then attracts people to talk about what's in the games, which attracts people who modify games, which attracts people to talk about how they made them. And there's kind of a virtuous yeah. cycle from playing to making. Mm. And that becomes, I think, more connected together. So I think if you talk to young people, and I use that anyone under my age, um, if you talk to young people about the relationship to games, they understand more about how they're made than I probably did when I was their age, because it was just this black wall yeah. of impenetrable exactly no one would talk about it and i didn't know mm. anyone who did it I, I you know i went to a careers evening a couple of years ago and the guy next to me was also from a games company talking to sixth form kids so parents mm. are games developers now yeah? yeah parents play games yeah it's no longer a weird hobby that means that communication about it is less stilted and less other yeah. than it used to be and I suppose we need to to a certain extent own that conversation no one else should be telling anyone to, how to make games aside from the industry right we should be out there talking to more people sharing. And, yeah I absolutely think yeah not so much telling sharing yeah. <laughs> having a lovely conversation and giving <laughs> yeah. some useful knowledge yes Thank exactly you. mentoring I think is the correct <laughs> That's a nice one but I did I went to a school a couple of years ago and I talked to a bunch of kids and I said oh we use unreal and Fantastically, one of the kids said, I don't like Unreal. I use Unity. Oh, bless them. Lovely. That they is were, fantastic. Uh, yeah, they, were, they already had an opinion that I was clearly wrong. But great, <laughs> because they were doing something. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they knew what was good for them, and they knew what yes. their strengths were, and, and yeah, therefore... absolutely. And yeah, that was not option. the case certainly when I... In fact, that's, that for me was kind of like, wow. Because normally I go there, and they say, well, how do you do this? How do you make games? And, and they, well, they were already doing it, yeah. and what they wanted was a little bit of perspective on, so you can pay a mortgage by doing this. Well, this is, is it, possible? and kind of working backwards as well. Yeah. Okay, so if I do this for a bigger company, then I can the mortgage yeah, yeah, thing yeah. comes in, and then mm-hmm. I can you know all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. it must be. Um, I hope it's a much more viable career option. I it, it is, although you do this is, this is te- you do meet parents who look at you like you're from Mars. Their kids are rush up to the thing and you've got a video playing of the game and you're like talking about and we, you know, we, we we do little flyers and things that explain different roles and responsibilities. We show them and the parents are like it's not accounting is it or architecture. And you're like no, it's fun. It's, you it's imagine fun. that having a career you've enjoyed for your whole life. Ooh. <laughs> wow, think of that. Yeah. Um, and of course, you have to, you know, and it, being able to tell someone I've, I've only ever made video games because I genuinely have. Mm. I've never had another job. I've never done any other work. 
apart from making video games. It's fantastic, though. So that's it? great. Yeah, and that, exactly. You know, you know what, I'm I happy. mean, what could be? Yeah, long may that continue. And and I really hope that just that, just that little snippet, is enough to inspire, hopefully, parents to think. Oh no, wait. Have fun for you know in your working life. That's the dream. Surely that's the dream. I th- I, I think that for a certain a certain type of person. It is the dream. Yes, I suppose it does depend on, <laughs> on where you've come from and what you were expected to do. Yes, I was my, never uh, going to be a doctor. No, this is Ever. it. My uh, my best friend got um, the highest, I didn't go to university, can you tell? The highest university mark uh, in, in maths and then became a game dev. And I remember saying, were your parents disappointed? <laughs> because I imagine they probably were in a, in a funny kind of way. Yeah. I think he's going to be running a bank or something, which yeah. is so bizarre. I mean, who would... You could run a bank from home nowadays, surely. You don't yeah. even need to go into the office for that. <laughs> um, okay. What did Guildford Games do best, in your opinion? What did Guildford Games do best? I know it's a broad question. That We've is, got a huge that... amount of stuff sitting under that umbrella, but... I think if you were to look today at, at, at games in Guildford, it would be a really interestingly diverse offering of games. I don't think... You know, we're the best at racing games or the best at strategy games or anything. You wouldn't say that Guildford is that because you couldn't. Yeah, because, you know, well, super massive, we're trying to scare the living daylights out of you on a regular and basis. And succeeding, yeah. Um, you know, you've got uh, Media Molecule who are trying to help you be creative and explore, you mm-hmm. know, an incredibly wide palette of, 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 of ideas within games. You've got, I, say, I mentioned Mojo Works, you know, trying to make adding games into the, your, the communication you have with your friends, just trying to do all these different ways of bringing games into your life. And mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the thing about the Guildford. If you step back, I think there's a pin in every single type of game in Guildford. I think you could use that as a lens. And mm-hmm. I think that's vibrant and that's really interesting. You know, you know I've, I've worked in places where every studio around you makes first-person shooters. And that's quite stressful after a while because yeah, you go, I, I don't want to make any more of those. <laughs> no, sorry, you've got to. The, the only this other is opportunity is a studio over here. I actually, though, I was offered the job once to make a wrestling game, but it was so outside of my <laughs> ability to even comprehend what that meant. I, I couldn't accept it. Um, but yeah, I think I think if you looked at Guildford, you'd say Guildford's strength is the diversity of opportunity within here the shape and size of the studios the shape and size of the games the kinds of games that are getting made here there's no one size fits all you can probably find everything here wonderful 